Uh, while we're waiting, if you turn to Luke chapter 17, please, and I'll do a quick review and uh, go further on. The plan is, and I'll use one of my, I don't know where I got this during the week, but it came to me, uh, I'll use one of my favourite metaphors in the Bible, dark and light. So chapter 17 of Luke, uh, you know uh, the context and I, I should say this, uh, when we, I felt a little bit guilty, oh man, I'm stuck in Luke and uh, the poor people, but you'll, you will notice I'll go back in the Old Testament and I will go forward into the epistles. So I, I use it sort of as a base and that's the way the Bible works anyway. So here, uh, what's the context? The context is Jesus is uh, uh, near the cross. He, he has his... Uh, people who are against him, the Pharisees, they are religious people, but they're phonies, they're hypocrites. And uh, he's exposing them for who they are. He says, you are they, in chapter 16, who justify yourselves before men, uh, but God knows your hearts. And he, he says the same to us today. He knows our hearts. Um, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the eyes of God. So he said all that. And now... Um, He's talking to his disciples and he's talking in chapter 17 and let's read it. And he talks uh, to the church as well. And he, this passage is found in Matthew chapter 18 and also in Mark chapter 9. And it's very important. He said, uh, then he said to his disciples, it's impossible but that offences will come. But woe unto him to whom, through whom they come. So he's saying it, you're going to live in an environment in the church and in the world where offences are going to come. Get over it. They're going to come. It's how you deal with these offences. And the offences doesn't, doesn't really mean how we, we see offences today so much. It means stumbling blocks. And we learnt last week that, uh, very quickly, uh, that the stumbling blocks are here. And this scale represents um, adorning the holiness of God. This, this is a representation of me as a Christian, a, a, a little one who believes in God. Me, you, a little one who believes in God. And part of my function is to not... <coughs> don't cause what? <coughs> offences to other people. I've got to speak the truth and I've got to live the truth. And I'm not to put stumbling blocks in the front of other people. And later on we'll see I end to do forgiveness to other people that do offend me. So there's a balance. And there's a picture of a Christian life. Uh, when I teach art, I teach uh, uh, balance. That's what you call perfect balance. Perfect symmetry. Bisymmetry, and then there's asymmetry. All right, this is uh, the cross of Christ. Is perfect balance. It's beautiful, isn't it? And my life should be in perfect balance, not causing offences and sins towards other people, and forgiving other people when they sin against me. And in perfect balance, when I live like that, I adorn the holiness of God, and I'm living like a Christian. Uh, uh, let's keep going. But woe to him to, through whom these offences come. So if I'm one of these people that are causing offences, woe to him, I, I'd be better off uh, executed. Verse 2, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Little ones are, uh, Matthew 18 tells us who they are, little ones are those who believe in him. I ask you a question today, are you a little one who believes in him? Yes, great. Well, the angels of God in heaven have your case. Do you know that? Matthew 18 says that. Angels in heaven are like sheepdogs. You ever watch the sheepdog? They just watch that shepherd and he just goes, choo, choo, and they fly off. What are angels? Ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. That's the little ones who believe in him. Don't ever think you're alone. You're not. You've got angels looking after you. Not a single guardian angel. Don't believe that. All right? 
It's their general job to look after the little ones who believe in him. And they have the Father's face and they minister. It, uh, verse 3, take heed to yourselves. What does that mean? Have a good look at yourself. Um, are you one of these people that are giving offences to the little ones? Are you one of these people that are not forgiving those who offend against you? You better take heed to yourself um, that you're living properly as a Christian, as a little one who believes. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And then we said what the process was last week. If someone sins against you, uh, by the way, they will, because it's impossible that it won't happen. So we got that. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's how you deal with it. And Matthew 18 says you go to your brother in, in private, he, he, uh, you don't get satisfaction, you take two or three witnesses, don't get satisfaction, tell the church, don't get satisfaction. What do you do? The person's put out of the church. That's what the Bible says. All right. Um, if he trespasses against you seven times in a day and, and, and when you go to him and he says, I repent, what, what do you do? You forgive him. How many times in a day do you forgive? Seven times seven, seven i.e. endlessly. We are, we as Christians are in a default position of forgiveness. And I was going to talk a bit about that this week, but I'm not now. It, it's, look, you've got to understand, I'll do two things uh, to explain forgiveness that I use for myself. The main ones are Ephesians. Be ye therefore tender-hearted, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even as what? Christ has forgiven you. Wayne Davis, you cannot have a higher standard than Jesus Christ. What are you going to not forgive people that he's forgiven? I can't be like that. So we, we have this default position of forgiveness. And uh, we are to be, love our enemies. Why? Because we are most like our Father in heaven when we are like that. Do you want to be like God? That's how you live your life. More about that later. Um, uh, verse 5, And the apostles said unto him, Lord, <laughs> and I didn't talk about this last week, but I'm quickly, you won't see me for a little while, so I'm going to rush through this and then uh, talk larger areas. Um, and the apostles said unto him, so who's he talking to? The foundation of the church. And they suddenly see the writing on the wall. This is not what we have been taught in our life. We are bitter against our enemies. Uh, we are taught to cause, we, we, we are taught to cause offences and so forth from child up. We've had our, um, our paradigm examples, the Pharisees, and they're a bunch of hypocrites. That's all we've been taught. And now all of a sudden we have this turned on its head by this person called Jesus Christ. And, and they cry out, they know what they need. And their need is faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. So they say to the Lord, increase our faith. They've got faith, but they want it increased. And Jesus says to them, if you, and he says this before, uh, in other passages he says, uh, about a mountain being put into the sea, not literally, and he's not talking about a tree being uprooted and literally being put in the sea here. It's a metaphor. Verse 6, he says, Lord, if we had the faith, the Lord said, if you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you would say that that uh, mulberry tree, really, be thou plucked up by the root and you would be planted in the sea and it would obey you. In other words... If you had mustard seed type faith, a mustard seed's a tiny seed. If you just recognised what a mustard, a tiny little seed, the fact that a tiny little seed will grow into a massive tree with massive roots into the ground, um, and what is little what can become so much bigger than what it started out as, a tiny little seed, you would be do, you would be able to do amazing things for God. Amazing things. If you just realise that, increase our faith. Well, just have the, 
have, have a faith that grows stronger and stronger by the day. So that when you depart this planet, you can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me. But don't worry, and then he goes on to say, don't worry about crowns now. Uh, the apostles said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said unto them, so forth. Verse 7, but which of you having, this sounds uh, disconnected, but it's not. <laughs> say say you, you become a Christian, you have mustard seed type faith that increases and grows and you get stronger and stronger in the faith and you start, uh, God starts using you to do amazing things in the kingdom of God. You might get back to flip things on the head. Instead of um, humbling yourself, you'll start exalting yourself again. And that's the last thing the Lord wants from us, is exaltation from us. And so he gives this story about a, a slave, not a servant, it's a doulos, which is a slave who goes and works for his Lord. I actually really love this verse. It... it um, Tickles my fancy, say it another way. It uh, tickles my sentiments about life and working and so forth. I really love it, and I, I didn't realise before. He tells the story about a slave. The slave works out in the fields. When he comes in, he makes the master's meal, and the implication is, oh, poor slave, surely this master's going to um, thank him for all this. You know, he's doing such a great job. And the master doesn't. What does the master say? Um, let's have a look. Um, verse 9. Does he thank that slave because he did the things that were what? Commanded of him. <laughs> uh, this is why you don't really have the King James Version all the, all the time. I trow not. <laughs> it's silly, isn't it? I trow not. Um, that's so uh, as Stuart England. Uh, so likewise you, when you have done all the things which are commanded of you, say, we were unprofitable servants, we have only done that which was our duty to do. Now, here you are, Christian. Don't you start looking around for, for certificates of appreciation from God or the church or, or anyone else. We, we live in a world of this rubbish now where people always want this honour from men and so forth and give me a certificate. No, 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 no. The Christian way is you are a Christian. You do your duty before God and just do it without complaining. Like you go to work and you go home and you go back to work the next day. You don't want people crawling all over you all day. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so great. That's the last thing you need. All right? It is your reasonable duty. The very best that we could ever do for God would be far less than what he deserved. Is it not? Just remember that. We just go about our duty as a Christian and just go about it till the day we die and increase in your faith and trust in him. Get over it. <laughs> right, that's that. Now I'll talk to it all. Uh, in a slightly different way, uh, because it raises, raises uh, beautiful. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I used to have a history teacher. Um, they used to give the cane in school. Some of you can remember that the history teacher used to go down the aisles. He just held the cane, <laughs> and we thought nothing of that. You know, it's a, such a different world, isn't it? Um, such a different world. All right. So. Um, I'm going to put this in this it's per big per big picture perspective. Uh, here, this is the kingdom of God. When we go down in uh, Luke, this very chapter, he's going to say that the kingdom of God is in you. <coughs> kingdom of God is in you. And you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. All right. Uh, but the, there's a grand kingdom which we've been learning with Daniel. That's a grand kingdom of the world. Uh, President Trump was part of that uh, overarching um, control of God for the affairs of the world. All right, that the bullet missed and so forth. We don't understand all of that. That's God's business. 
but he is, you read the Old Testament, God is pulling the strings behind the scenes everywhere. Just read it. It's on almost every page. He's, he's in total control of the universe. However, the universe has rebelled. We know that. The universe is cursed. But bear in mind, as I said last week, it's cursed by who? God. God cursed it. And think of it this way. Satan, um, God is actually Satan's God. He's in control of all that. Meanwhile, um, we'll go back to the past, the present, and the future. The past. To try and make this graphically work. Genesis 1, 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. So I'm going to use the metaphor light and darkness. Because darkness can come into the church. It's very important to understand. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the light. And the, dark, and the light he called day, and the darkness he called night. And that becomes in the Bible a, 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 a physical thing in the universe. I'm an artist, light is so important to me. It's everything to me, physical light. But it's also a metaphor for moral light and moral darkness, intellectual light and intellectual darkness as well, as we'll see. Now, as an artist... Um, if this was, we came in here at midnight and all the lights were out, you would not have any light and dark. It would be all dark. And God said, let there be light. And when I teach someone how to paint a portrait, first thing I say is put a light on that head. <laughs> so I've stuck an artificial light on this head. Obviously. And, and I get people... Uh, saying to me, I can't, and I say, now all you, all you do is you divide the light from the dark. Oh, I can't see where the light, I can't see where the dark is. And you know what I say to them? Put a stronger light on it. Make the light stronger so you can see where the light is and you can see where the shadow is, the dark is. And in art, we call this line... A number of things, but one of the terms we use is the bed bug line. Because it's bed bugs don't like light. And so we call it the bed bug line. As an artist, you must find the bed bug line if you want to paint a portrait that looks like that actual person. Bed bugs <coughs> stay in the dark. A bed bug doesn't want to come into the light. And so we call it the bed bug line. So let's keep going with the metaphors. Uh, 1 John 1 5. 1 John 5, 1 John 5, 1 John 1 5, the 7 says, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If anyone says that he has fellowship with him, I'm in the light but walks in darkness, he is a what? He's a liar. And he does not the truth. And when it says God is light, it means God, God represents truth. Intellectually, he represents truth as opposed to error. So when we shine light onto this world, we shine truth onto this world we do it that's what a sermon does that's what when you open the bible it is shining light onto this world truth as opposed to error what was the pharisees big problem they taught error they lessened the law instead of holding it up they just taught error they didn't teach the people the true way of salvation they said it was through the keeping of the law and they couldn't keep the law they taught error and morally, morally, um, this is where sin is in the darkness. This is where holiness and righteousness is, this kind of life. 
that doesn't cause um, offences to other people and does forgive those that forgives them. So morally, intellectually, God is light. And by the way, light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. They love to be with the bed, but bed bugs. All right. And darkness in its extreme form is Luke chapter 16. The darkness, the blackness of darkness forever is hell. That's a description of hell. <clears throat> uh, no one has excuse. Um, uh, Romans chapter 1 tells us that people that live in darkness do... People who live in moral darkness have no excuse because God has given them a conscience. Romans chapter 2. People who live in uh, intellectual darkness have no excuse because God has given them a rational brain to know that uh, the idols they are worshipping are not the true idols. And everyone in Golden today is without excuse, morally and intellectually, for not coming from darkness into light. No one is without excuse in this world. All right. Um, uh, I talked about, I'll talk about it now, a strong light and a soft light. Yeah, I'm just working my way through here. I'm going to say a lot of scriptures because it's quicker. Otherwise, it's a Bible study. So, um, when I said strong light, that's a strong light. As opposed to a soft light. If I, if I want to prove to you the Bible is a strong light, I just quote Hebrews 14. The, the Word of God is what? Alive and powerful. It's a powerful light. Uh, shining into the into a person's soul, dividing the spirit and the soul and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of a person's heart. And there's no man that is not laid open and bare before the word of God. That is a strong light. So when we open the Bible, it tells us who we are, where we're going, why we're here, how we should behave, particularly if we're in the light. Okay, so... Uh, we call this our position. If, how do you get from here? We were born here and we go to there. How do you get there? Um, Colossians 1.12 We give thanks unto the Father who has delivered us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have fellowship with him. That's how we get there. John 8, 42. Uh, there is a father in this area. If God were your father, you would do the deeds of your father. But you have the father in here who is the devil. You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do if you live in there. So unless we can come from here to there, we do whatever the devil wants us to do. And that's the lost world today. 2 Corinthians 4, But if our gospel, the gospel of light, be hid, it is hid from those who are in darkness, in whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should, what? Shine unto them. And now... What happened? Jesus said, I am coming to the world. Uh, John 1, 1, uh, in, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was made flesh, and the Word dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. And then he says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are, in fact, evil. Okay. <clears throat> Is 
It's very important to get from there to there. How do you get from there to there? By faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are translated from that kingdom into the kingdom of light by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the knowledge, we have the knowledge of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in the in the glory, manifest in the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we go, we go all through the Gospel of Luke, those people were staring into the face of Jesus Christ, who is the glory of God looking at them. And we have that same message that light has come into the world and men can come to the light we have the same message in our earthen bodies. So now the light has gone from the world and the light says to us, what? You are the light of the world. Got it? You are the light of the world. A city, <coughs> you and me, that is set on a hill cannot what? Be hid. Neither do men take a light and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a lampstand that everyone who walks into the house may see it. And Jesus says to us now, let your light so shine before men that they may what? See your good works, that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. Our position as people in the light, our walk as people in the light, should match our position as people in the light. That is New Testament theology. And so, um, we come to this uh, issue that they've got here. Oh, I will say this before I go to it. If the gospel's here, then we, we're the... You know what James says? If, if you... If you say you hear the word of God, the quick and powerful, sharp and any two-edged sword, dividing the, 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 the sunder between the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, you say you believe all this. James says, if you're a hearer of the word, you're hearing it now. If you're a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, you are like what? A man that gets a mirror, like I did this morning, gets a mirror, looks at himself in the mirror, sees, oh, I missed that bit with my shaving, or oh, there's a bit of dirt there, puts the mirror down and goes away and does nothing. That's what a Christian is who is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. That man's religion is in vain. It's useless. He is not light in the world. He is not salt in the world. He or she. All right, and it looks like this. I can easily destroy this drawing. Uh, this is called unity, by the way. It's actually the bride of Christ. I've got a good ending, I think. <laughs> I'm about to destroy uh, this drawing for you. And I often do this in art classes, but, but I do it when I'm drawing. I do a really nice thing and then wreck it to teach them a hard lesson. You ready? I'm going to make this, this drawing awful. It's not so nice now, is it? All of it. Just not unified anymore, is it? The light's not the light, and the dark's not the dark. What's happened? Dark has come into the light. That's it. Can't have that. What do you do? All right, I'll even wreck it worse. You ready? What's happened now? Light's gone into the dark. It's so fractured, isn't it? It's just not good at all. Sometimes unity is good, sometimes unity is bad. Alright, so, 
Oh, beg, beg your pardon. Sometimes division is good. Sometimes division is bad. And we're talking about division. We're talking about, what is it, Luke 17? It's impossible that offences will come. How do you deal with all these offences? Well, under him, through whom they come. And if you go to, and I will quickly, um, I'll go to Corinthians, one of my favourite books. I'll be dead before I preach Corinthians, so I better do it. I better do it now. Uh, but, oh, the rapture, yeah, yeah. If you go to the first chapter of Corinthians, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Um, I don't want you all chopped up. Uh, what was their problem? They had a personality code. Oh, a uh, cult. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of, I'm of Christ. You know, the super holy ones. And he says, that's not good. Uh, these, these contentions among you, and I, I contend that they didn't really understand what love was. And when you understand what love is, you'd get rid of a lot of these things. They did not understand what this was. They did not understand humility. They did not understand the danger of pride, human pride. They didn't understand it. Consequently, of course, you're going to have divisions. But later on in chapter 11, uh, in chapter 5, he gets really cranky with them. He says, it's reported commonly among you that there's fornication, sexual sin among you, such as not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his stepmother's wife, his stepmother, uh, sexually. And you're puffed up and you haven't mourned, you haven't repented. And Paul's saying, what's up with you? You can't even deal with a simple thing like this in your church. Your glory, in verse 6, is not good. Purge out, therefore, the leaven. And I told you examples where I had to do that when I was pastoring. And I had to do it to people that were near and dear to my heart. Family matters. All right? That's just the way God, the church, has to operate. And then later on he says, uh, the same chapter, he says, uh, verse 12, he says, For what have I to do to judge them that are outside? It's not my judge, uh, my job, Paul says, to judge these people out there. My job for these people out here is to evangelise them. My job, though, is to deal with the people in here. And what does he say to do? Uh, for what have I to do to judge them that are without? No, that's God's. God will judge the world. Our job is to evangelise the world, to be salt to the world, to be light to the world. Let your light shine across to that world. Um, I could go... Uh, verse 13. But them that are without, God judges. Uh, them that are within, who judges? You do. On behalf of God. You do. Read chapter 18 of Matthew. I haven't got time today. All right? And when you do it, uh, what, you, uh, what, what you approve will be approved in heaven. You're not the Pope. You're a Christian. And you're a Christian church, a com community. All right? And when you do it, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. That is not a prayer meeting. All right? That's the church judging its own within the church. I hear that so often as prayer meetings. I, I never, I rarely correct it, but it's got to be in context properly. Now go to chapter 11, I'll show you a good division. Uh, uh, chapter 11, you know the chapter 11 is about communion. We've read it many times, but some of the verses people miss. Uh, Uh, verse 19, and he says, uh, verse 18, he says, First of all, when you come together in the church, so what's he talking about? When you come together in the church, I hear, says Paul, that there are divisions among you. Some, some will say, uh, and partly he says, I believe it. And this is so interesting, verse 19, for there what? must be divisions. Why? Because it's inevitable that these things will happen. We're in a fallen world. 
And then he says that they, what, what, what the divisions will do is actually something good. They will, it will sort the people out who are approved and they will be made manifest among you. So it's divisions and judging in the church and so forth and sorting out the matters in, in the church is a good thing in the sense that it will sort out um, light from dark. All right, sin, sin, uh, sin from sin from righteousness, uh, God's word from error. That's what will happen. Now, I'm going to restore unity. Is there anything worse? Is there any anything worse than you know what the church has done for years, and I've watched it as a. Uh, an old Christian, this will make you feel better. Look, you're feeling better already. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Visual. That's annoying you. You're not an Indian. There you go. You feel so much better. Okay. Is, is there anything worse than the church looking across there and saying, we'll win you by being like you? Is there any more, anything more hideous? And... I know it's my, my uh, perennial bandwagon, but when you, this is what we call in art a hard light. It's, you can see it clearly. But is there anything more hideous than a, a silly sign outside a church that, that makes it hard to see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Some stupid little psychological saying about helping yourselves. All right? That's what we call in art a sock. It's, oh, turn the light up so I can see. And they don't. They make it, they think they're helping God and they're not. But I don't want to get on that bag being making again. But I did. Okay, so. Um, all right, I'm going to finish up. Finish on a good note. Uh, what's your attitude when you're sorting out all your problems you have in the church, which are inevitable? inevitable. Uh, James chapter 1 um, says when all kinds of trials and temptations come into your lives my brothers don't present them as intruders welcome them as friends oh yippee I've got another problem no um, uh, realise that they come to test your faith what did the apostles ask Jesus in chapter 17 in Increase my faith. But let the process <coughs> go on so that you may become fully mature, men of mature character. And if in the process somebody doesn't know how to deal with anything, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. And he may be quite sure that the necessary wisdom will be given him. But he must ask in sincere faith without secret doubts as to whether he really wants God's help or not. The man who trusts God, but with inward reservations, is like a wave of the sea, carried forward by the wind one moment and driven back the next. And the life of a man of divided lowly cannot receive anything from the Lord. Now, good finish for you. I'm going to give you the best news. And I'm on a high over this. I'm going into the future and finishing with this. Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a preview of heaven. You can have heaven on earth now if you like. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has anything in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him? By the way, that's not talking about heaven. That's talking about now. A lot of people get that wrong too. It's talking about now. Anyway, but let's have a preview. Chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven <coughs> and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city. 
the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride <coughs> adorned for her husband. Ah, what's one of the metaphors for the church? The bride of Christ. Yeah. Beautiful. This bride is getting all the dirt gone. It's great, isn't it? Heaven. That's what it looks like. Uh, graphically. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. <coughs> and they shall be his people. And God himself self shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more crying, neither sorrow, nor tears, no more death. And now chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and either side of it, there was a tree of life which bare 12 minute fruits, etc., for the healing of the nations. Doesn't this world need that? And there shall be no more curse. No more darkness. It's gone. That's a picture of heaven. There's no darkness. Wow, that's something to look forward to. Um, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be, listen carefully, no night there. No more darkness. And there's, they won't need a candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. What a day that will be. The world only knew that before the fall in the garden. And it will know it here. In the meantime, we do our best to bring light to any situation that we are confronted with, beginning in our own lives. And then we let our light so shine before men, that they may see that. Increase our faith to live like that. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we are so blessed uh, to be called children of light. We are no more partakers of darkness, Father. And you just tell us simply to walk in the light as he is in the light. Give us the strength, give us the, give us the faith to obey you. Father, give us the strength of faith to put away ourselves, Father, and to exalt you before men. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>